Okay, so this one is devoted to the first part of uh, analyzing Kruger's mo Krugman's model of international trade under increasing returns and monopolistic competition. And yeah, okay, so let's start. So we assume that overall utility, you know, utility of all the agents in the economy can be described as sum of individual utilities of individual agents. So this will be sum of U of CI. So in this case, we assume that all the agents have symmetrical preferences, which basically means that everyone had the same shape of utility curve. So CY stands for consumption of good Y. And here we have the following assumptions. So the first derivative of this value is assumed to be uh, sorry, positive, of course, positive as always. And the second derivative is negative. So those two assumptions combined stand for the famous low flow variety assumption. And you know, interpreting this in the simplest possible way uh, would sound as follows. Consumers like consumption, but they get satiated with consuming one type of goods. Like, let's say industry I produces sneakers. So if you have two pairs of sneakers, probably you will not buy, you know, another one. You will buy something different, you know, elegant shoes or whatsoever. Ridiculous example, but you got the idea. So again, you know, still your utility will increase if you consume additional unit of good. However, it will increase at the decreasing rate. You know, you're sometimes, at some point, your preferences are satiated. So, yeah. Basically, it also means that if you choose between two goods, like let's say I and I plus one, and you already have one unit of good I, and you have zero units of good I plus one, then you will derive more utility from purchasing I plus one. You know, again, you love variety, you would like to purchase something different, something you do not have. And basically, yeah, this coincides with the nature of monopolistically competitive markets. Like, they sell similar goods, but not perfectly homogeneous goods, like on the perfectly competitive markets. Like, basically speaking, t-shirt is a t-shirt, you know, but by differentiating the product, you know, they just decrease your elasticity. We will discuss this in a second. Okay, um, okay, so this will go. Let's proceed to the production side. So Li is equal to um, alpha plus beta times Xi. And here Xi stands for output in sector I. Here, alpha will stand for the fixed cost, and we can easily prove that this cost function exhibits a constant marginal cost and decreasing average total cost. So, marginal cost will be equal to derivative of Li with respect to Xi, it will be equal to beta. Um, actually, yeah, I forgot to mention alpha and beta are constant and they are bigger than zero. So marginal cost will be constant and average total cost will be calculated as cost function, total cost function, alpha plus beta times Xi 
divided by x. So actually it's easy to see that when level of output increases, average total cost will decrease. cost decreases when level of output increases. Uh, this is the simplest possible example of economies of scale because here we assume that the source of economies of scale you know is fixed cost because I think this logic is clear yes if you have constant marginal cost each time when you calculate average total cost it consists of marginal cost plus fixed cost divided by level of output. So portion of fixed cost which is assigned to this particular unit of output on average. So yeah, it's easy to see where that marginal cost component will not change, but fixed cost component, I mean this one, will decrease. But actually economies of scale can also arise from increasing returns to scale, you know when production function is characterized by increasing returns to scale, it can arise from, you know, knowledge spillovers, whatever. Okay, at this point it will go. So marginal cost is constant, average total cost function is a decreasing function. So average total cost will decrease when level of output increases. So the additional assumption is that uh, is that representative worker representative worker is also a representative consumer. stands for output of good I. Yeah, like output is equal to number of consumers times consumption per capita. Honestly, I believe it's pretty intuitive. So is there anything? Yeah, one more point. So final assumption is full employment. So L, you know, the stock of labor force in the economy is equal to, you know, the aggregate value of all the workers employed in different sectors, Li, and it's also equal to the aggregate number of workers needed for producing goods. Yeah, and we assume that the stock of labor is fixed at this moment. Okay, I believe it's pretty intuitive. Okay, it's, it's not visible. So this is L, I. Like labor employed in sector I. And you know, it should be like this value of aggregate labor, you know, employed in all the sectors should be equal to 
the value corresponding to the size of labor force needed for producing all the goods in all the sectors. So something like this. Okay, so now finally we are done with assumptions and we can proceed to modeling. So first we start with consumer side and we assume that consumers um, ultimate aim is utility maximization. So what we have to do is to maximize this function u of ci with respect to the price of this good phi phi. So if you want to do this using the method of Lagrangian multiplier, ah, not at this point, then you will get L equal to u ci uh, plus m minus phi phi times c i. Okay, M will stand for income. We are not really interested in this right now. So using first order condition, you will get uh, first derivative of utility function uh, minus, okay, yeah, sorry. I'm really sorry for this. I almost forget to put lambda in front of brackets first. Minus lambda times q. Then you have to equalize it to zero because again this is first order maximization condition. So it tells you that the rate of change of this function with respect to ci should be, should be equal to zero. So from this we can derive u prime ci is equal to lambda times pi. Um, okay, also please keep in mind that it's not that critical at this point, but it will be important later, that lambda is derivative of R with respect to income. So basically it will stand for the marginal utility of income. to do is to detect elasticity of demand. So you will get 
uh, second derivative of utility with respect to ci times lambda to the power minus 1, you have to divide it by average function. So average function will be first derivative of ci times lambda minus 1 multiplied by ci. So actually you have to divide by uh, this divided by ci, but you know it will be just identical if you take it here and multiply it. Just simplify my life a bit. Okay, so here we can get rid of those. So as a result, you get u, second derivative of utility with respect to ci, times ci, divided by first derivative of utility function with respect to ci. So this is elasticity of price with respect to consumption, but what we are interested in is actually elasticity of consumption with respect to price. And in order to find this, you just have to divide 1 by elasticity of price with respect to consumption, and it will give you derivative of u with respect to ci divided by the second derivative of utility function with respect to ci times c. Okay, because as I mentioned before, what we analyze here is Inverted demand function, inverted inverse. Okay, inverted, I think. So basically, it tells you what is the relationship, uh, what is the dependency of price on quantity, cons of con quantity consumed or C. And here we want to define the dependency of consumption on price. So here it will go. So finally, as you can see, it will be negative. So we assume the second derivative of ci um, was negative following the law of variety. So what actually Krugman does in his original article, he just puts zero in front of this. So this is negative by default because you have second derivative of utility with respect to consumption as negative value. So if you add minus in front, then you will get positive value. And demand actually has negative... Uh, elas so elasticity of demand, price elasticity of demand is negative by default. So actually it makes sense. Then you just get a positive value. It's easier to analyze in absolute terms. Okay, here we go. So finally here we have elasticity. So actually the profit maximization condition for firm is that price has to be equal to price markup. I will get back to this in a second. Times marginal cost. So beta times W, where W stands for wage per worker, will stand for marginal cost. And elasticity divided by elasticity minus 1 will stand for price markup. marginal cost and market price. So obviously if market power is bigger, then price markup is bigger accordingly. And let us do one more trick, you know, to have everything well organized. Okay, so at this point something went terribly wrong with sound, video, and probably me as well. So what I meant is that there is an inverse relationship between price markup and price elasticity of demand, and we can prove this formally. So this expression stands for the price markup. As I said, you know, it just indicates uh, the relationship between marginal cost and market price. 
So if you take the derivative of price markup with respect of price elasticity of demand, this is what you get. And the value will be negative. So you will get minus 1 over E minus 1 square. This is positive. By default, this is negative. So the value of this ratio is negative. So based on this, we conclude that increase in price elasticity of demand results in the decrease of price markup and decrease in elasticity results in the increase in price markup. So I believe it makes sense, you know, because uh, high elasticity of demand means that consumers are extremely responsive to changes in price. So relatively small change in price will be accompanied by significant decrease in quantity demanded and as a result, you know, firms have less market power. So, yeah, just to make a final conclusion, uh, if demand is less elastic, then price markup takes bigger value and market power of individual firms is higher. So analysis of elasticities was kind of finalizing points, a uh, point when um, analyzing uh, demand side, I mean demand for the good produced by individual firm. And next point is defining, how to say it, like analyzing this problem from the perspective of producers. And we start with defining, you know, target for um, optimization, which is profit function. So the profit of individual firm selling good Y is equal to price of Y times level of output of Y minus alpha plus beta xy in brackets. So this expression standard for um, the number of workers employed in uh, the sector I or saying more formally number of units of labor employed in sector y I and W stands for wage per worker. So basically if alpha plus beta times xi stands for li uh, number of workers employed in this sector. Then... Okay, so all the firms attempt to maximize their profit. This implies that marginal revenue, slope of total revenue function, has to be equal to the slope of total cost function. Then marginal revenue will be equal to marginal cost, and first order profit maximization condition will be fulfilled. So, take a look. Here, as we discussed before, total cost is just a linear function. Um, yeah, I believe it was uh, alpha plus beta times the level of output. So, here you have it, with the positive value of intercept, reflecting the fact that we actually have fixed cost alpha. So, in this case, you know, in short run... Uh, Total revenue function, total revenue 1, can be located about total cost function. In this case, when we equalize the slope of total revenue and total cost functions, like A will be the point of profit maximization, and in this case, total revenue will lie about total cost function. And, you know, the difference between total revenue and total cost will stand for profit. So... Yeah, basically, you know, as simple as it is. So the fact that there is a vertical distance between total revenue and total cost curve implies that the firm has short run profit, which will be described by this distance. I know that this area is shaded, but, you know, I just did it for the sake of simplicity because it was impossible to put everything on this graph. Okay, so this is fine. Uh... Monopoly can make positive profit in the long run perspective, but here, you know, the key is the presence or the absence of barriers to exit. On monopolistic market, there are high barriers to enter. So even though one firm can make abnormal profit, uh, other firms cannot just enter the same market, you know, and try to make abnormal profit as well. However, this is not true for monopolistically competitive markets. 
uh, consider an example, like you come up with some kind of, I don't know, some kind of product, I don't know, maybe chocolate or something like this. So it's different a bit from all the types of chocolate supplied on the market. I don't know, maybe it's less harmful for teeth or anything like this. So in short run, you make abnormal profit. However, nothing can prevent other firms from entering your market niche, you know, and supplying the same product. Or let's say very similar product, because again, monopolistic competition, no barriers to entry. So in this case, new firms will start to sell similar product, which will decrease demand for your product and total revenue function will shift down accordingly. Well, it's not exactly shift, you know, because still you start at point zero zero, but you've got the idea. So we move from total revenue one to total revenue two. At this point, again, profit maximization condition tells you that you should find the point of tangency of total revenue curve and total cost curve. For total revenue 2, this point is B. However, you know, there is zero profit because at point B, total revenue is exactly equal to total cost. That's why in uh, the long run perspective, uh, all the firms operating on monopolistically competitive markets make normal profit or profit equal to zero or zero profit. That's why, you know, what I'm going to discuss in a second is called zero profit condition or normal profit condition. So this implies that Pi xi is equal to alpha w plus uh, beta xi times w. You divide both sides by w and multiply by x simultaneously. So you will get P over w uh, plus alpha over x uh, plus beta. And as a number, we assume that L, um, sorry, X should be equal to L times C. So overall production is equal to consumption per capita times number of workers. So here you can replace it with alpha divided by L times C plus beta or beta plus alpha over L times uh, 1 over C. Ta-da! Okay, so finally we have to draw what we think and you know, see what will happen. Z. 
z function. So basically, this is the relationship between price and consumption, which follows profit optimization condition. So here we have producer side. Here is the relationship between, you know, consumption, uh, which follows from consumer utility maximization condition. So again, as you remember, if consumption increases, then elasticity increases, price markup increases, and price increases respectively. So here we are going to have upward slope function, uh, which again follows consumer utility optimization condition. And in this way, we defined equilibrium level of output and we define uh, equilibrium price per wage ratio. Like one then you have to multiply this by wage and you will receive production cost.